Ju Hawil, not so late, go Elkin Tahoe. Who pick up on Alanua? Rob the Skinakui, eat some miska, go Robrin. Oh, take she up. Who caught Haman Tirka? Ye stuck shitman had Kakui. O Hogabandrina, how we look in Hinail. O Hosak led so a good Tirkaki. Tirkaku with so Tirk Tirka or Wadney. O Nut Hatlinaku for Isle of Tahoe. What did she had? Who caught Haman? How are men so as a second house in Nile? Jude, they go, Our day begins with an expression of gratitude for the gift of life that we have been provided. We trace our roots back to our origin, the first breath, the first steps taken upon these lands. The wisdom and strength of our ancestors courses through our veins, passed from generation to generation. With care and gentleness, we carry forth our obligation to add to these teachings and pass them along to the next generations so that they may walk gently upon this land and thrive. Our way of life was crafted through thousands of years of connecting with our lands and waters. We recognize that all life is precious and contains a spirit, and none are superior nor inferior to another. Our life stems from the abundance of the ocean and land. We have established an expertise in harvesting foods, medicines, and other day-to-day -day materials to live a comfortable life. We are the people of the ocean. We are a whaling society. We are warriors and healers. Our nations are many and we live along every inlet, harbor, river, and stream along the western coast of this great island. Our hereditary chiefs and their advisors maintain stewardship over our lands and ensure that our protocols and laws are followed so that future generations may share in the abundance of our territories. We recognize that there is an holistic nature to our health and well-being. The foods that we harvest and preserve, the medicines that we gather, the spirituality that we practice, our language, songs, and dances, all play an important role in determining who we are, as well as affecting our health. Our observance of the diverse nature of our health is evident within the role of Ushtakyu the spiritual doctor. Our active lifestyle and diet of local indigenous foods have become ingrained as daily routine among our people. This has resulted in a very low rate of disease and sickness throughout our nations. Occasionally, we do experience illness, but our perspective and approach to such occurrences is primarily spiritual in nature. Our Ushtakyu devote their lives to gain an ability to heal. Through strict spiritual cleansing and rituals, they strive to make connections with spiritual entities that will gift them with these abilities. Few succeed in these attempts, but those that do earn a place of respect and honor throughout our nations. Once they receive a spiritual medicine and ability to heal, they must remain humble and not advertise their ability for gifts of this nature may just as easily be taken as given by the spirit world. When a person becomes unwell, it is recognized that a spiritual sickness, known as mayathi, has overtaken them. It is the role of the Ushtakyu to remove the sickness and dispose of it in a safe place so that it will not affect anyone else. It is also believed that it is not solely the person that provides such healing, but rather the spirit itself that uses the Ushtakyu as a vessel to perform the healing practice. Once the sickness is removed, the Ushtakyu and the patient's family continue to provide medicinal teas and ointments to assist in their recovery. The ways of our people are thoughtfully crafted by each generation. 
We care for one another as we do ourselves. We depend upon one another as individuals, families, communities, and nations. We respect the diverse and unique strength that each person offers so that our lives may be fuller and richer. This is reflected by the size of our families that are large and include the entire extended family living together in harmony in one house. <laughs> These are the ways of our ancestors that still hold true to this day. By carrying forward these traditions and values, we maintain an interconnectedness that binds us together as one. This is the way that we used to be. Life among our people remained largely undisturbed for thousands of years. Intricate trade systems were established north and south along the coastline, as well as deep into the interior of the mainland. Our connections with other nations introduced different foods, technologies, and protocols. Throughout these exchanges, we maintained a strong and unique cultural identity. The ebb and flow of times of peace and prosperity would periodically give way to times of hardship and warfare. Mostly, life throughout our territories continued as it always had, as our teachings and knowledge were enhanced and passed along from generation to generation through stories, song, and practice. As our way of life continued to adapt to the ever-changing environment around us, so too did the rest of the world. Civilizations rose and sank from places of power. The curiosities of the broader world became more vivid with each further step that was taken. Until one day, that curiosity arrived upon our shores. Unbeknownst to our people, the first contact with Mamakhni, the floating people, would usher in a new and voracious chapter in our way of life. By the time the European and American peoples made their way to our territories, the destructive path of colonialism and global expansion was already well underway. We'd heard stories of such people, but never dreamt of the significance that their arrival would have upon our people, lands, and way of life. As is our custom, we were welcoming when the newcomers had arrived. Our beachkeepers greeted them upon our shores and invited them to meet and feast with our hereditary chiefs. From those first fateful days, it became clear that the newcomers were very different in nature and knew very little about our people and our ways. They referred to us as Nutkin Indians, a strange and foreign title that bears no significance to who we are. The name Nutka originating from a miscommunication upon their arrival when we had instructed them to anchor their ships around the bend, Nutka Siechkum the term Indian, presumably from another miscommunication from another time and place. Nonetheless, they were invited into our houses, fed, and entertained in the ways of our people. They took an interest in the pelts and furs and other resources harvested throughout our territory. In exchange for some of the novelties that they had stored within their ships, they traded for these goods and returned to their distant homelands. It did not take long for more ships to arrive with similar offers, as a resourceful and trading people, we were happy to barter. Eventually, the trade ships began to be accompanied by naval escorts, and the men arriving were not always of the most favorable character. Quite often, the men aboard their ships appeared malnourished and sickly. Our Ushtakyu assisted them as they would one of our own. After a little time had passed, their arrival would often lead to a breach in our protocols and customs. Their interest in our resources continued to grow, and a lack of respect toward our chiefs and laws raised concern. Ultimately, this led toward a hostile relationship that would see retaliatory attacks back and forth. Our villages would be bombarded with cannon fire. In return, their ships would be destroyed and sunk. 
These skirmishes would last for up to half a century. As time moved on, more ships continued to arrive. But, rather than engaging in trade, these ships brought with them settlers from their distant homelands. With them, they brought an assortment of flora and fauna to make our lands look and feel more like their own. They constructed military forts with large wooden walls to protect them from the unknown wilderness. Their gunboats patrolled the waters to survey the land and exercise an assumed authority over our people. And, stowed away aboard their ships, they inadvertently imported the deadliest item, disease. Through a 20-year period in the mid-19th century, measles and smallpox spread through our communities and killed up to 90% of our population. Those of our people that were fortunate to be further away harvesting foods while the diseases spread through our communities were the likeliest to survive. The rest of our families attempted to care to the sick and eventually fell to the sicknesses themselves. Our Ushtakyu, overwhelmed and unfamiliar with these foreign diseases, simply could not contain it from spreading. Our world was in turmoil. Perhaps the most damaging aspect of these diseases, even more so than the loss of loved ones and the traumatic effect this had upon the survivors, was the fact that most susceptible to these diseases were the young and the elderly. The sacred bond between grandparent and grandchild that maintained the transfer of ancient knowledge and wisdom from generation to generation took the brunt of these diseases. With these losses came the loss of inherent values and intergenerationally crafted practices. The woven strands of each generation that made up our social fabric unraveled and altered our future course. Adding to this extremely devastating experience was the neglect and unwillingness to help from the newcomers. Our cries for help fell upon deaf ears. Fueling this destructive spread of disease, it was seemingly of benefit to the newcomers for us to simply die off and clear the land for the sake of progress and civilization. We were unaware that the generous gifting of blankets to our sick and dying were infested with disease. Our focus shifted quickly from the wailing and warrior traits of our ancestors to simply attempting to keep traces of our way of life alive. During this time, the colonies of Vancouver Island and British Columbia were established and would soon merge. A larger influx of European peoples meant the development of more forts and townships. As disease rapidly lowered our population, the newcomers' population continued to increase. Despite the hardships that accompanied disease, we continued to live a way of life that we were born within. Our language, connection to land, and spiritual worldview wavered but would not fall. This became problematic to the governing bodies that were establishing themselves upon our territories. We became known as the Indian problem. New laws were put into place to deal with this issue. The Indian Act created the reserve system, the band council structure, and defined who an Indian person was based upon blood quantum. It became illegal for us to practice our culture and medicinal practices. Our hereditary chiefs and Ushtakyu were denied their right to oversee our people in the way that we had developed for ourselves. All of this was expediently enforced through colonial law enforcement. Our surviving chiefs, Medicine people and warriors that opposed these changes were arrested and imprisoned or publicly hanged. Our way of life, our connection to the lands and waters, our observance of spirit in all living things around us was forced to change, and the land itself also began to feel the impacts of this change. Following after the measles and smallpox epidemics, further waves of disease continued to spread throughout our communities. Our already decimated population would face whooping cough, tuberculosis, influenza, a seemingly endless list of diseases that would continue to challenge the strength of our cultural identity and push us closer to the brink of extinction. The new settlements that were being constructed initially remained quite distant, but as fishing canneries and logging camps began to move closer to our communities, the fear of contagion and the spread of disease through non-Indigenous communities 
became a threat. It was believed during this time that we lacked spirituality and our misconceived godlessness was contributing to our vulnerability to disease. Efforts were undertaken to save our people from ourselves. Missionaries spread religion through our communities. In return for forsaking our ancestral ways, we would receive medical services. Children were removed from their families and placed into residential schools for purification and salvation. As fears of contagion continued to grow, it became illegal for our people to leave the reserve without the permission of an Indian agent. Likewise, it was illegal for non-Indigenous peoples to enter a reserve without permission from the same Indian agents. As time moved forward, the misplaced title of Nutkin Indian was never a point of question or concern. Communication across cultures was seldom and was generally discouraged. Gradually, we began to adopt the name and applied the negative connotations to ourselves. Society was far from accommodating, and our people endured a multitude of racism and prejudice. Our pride and spirit as the first peoples of this land began to give way to assimilation and conformity. Many memories and teachings became lost or forgotten to our people. Our children that returned from the residential schools could no longer speak our language and were disconnected from our lands and culture. Add to this the horrific experiences that they were forced to endure through these schools and the result would prove to be a recipe for disaster. Like our culture, spirituality, and language, the surrounding lands and waters also face the hardships introduced through the arrival of a new way of life. The salmon, once a main staple in our traditional diet, quickly depleted in number. The forests, home to an abundance of spirits and provider of warmth, clothing, medicines, food, shelter, and transportation, would also reel from the effects of encroachment and exploitation. As our connection to the lands and waters were replaced with the ideations of material wealth, the ancient world of our ancestors crumbled away. However, along this path, there remained a spirit that could not be broken. Despite the enormity of challenges that we faced, there were elements of our ancestral way of life that would not simply vanish. During the most challenging times, our cultural practices and spirituality survived in secrecy in exile within our own traditional homelands. Although much had changed and the world around us reflected these changes, we managed to survive through our core values and teachings of love, laughter, and togetherness. These are the changes that happened to our people. By the mid 20th century, our people and culture had undergone many drastic changes. The world of our ancestors would be forever changed but these times of world-shifting magnitude were not new to us. Throughout our history, we encountered and persevered through a wide range of events, such as famine, floods, earthquakes, tidal waves, forest fires, and extended periods of darkness. As a result, our resilience as a people has only grown stronger. And, like those ancient times, we relied heavily upon the foundational strength and guidance of our ancestors. The wide-scale changes that we are experiencing largely stem from a lack of communication across cultures. We understood that the newcomers to our lands still knew very little about our culture and practices. The common perspective that was cast upon our people was that we needed help, or that in order to succeed it was necessary for us to adapt and conform to non-Indigenous ways. Emphasis was not generally placed upon the strengths and abilities contained within our culture and spirituality but rather the need for us to change and be like everyone else. Efforts were undertaken to overcome the overwhelming level of diseases that were prevalent within our communities. While children were being removed and placed in residential schools, the sick were similarly taken to Indian hospitals. These facilities were also very distant from our homelands and extremely foreign in nature. And through fear of contagion, the children that were taken to these hospitals would often spend many months away from the support and love of their families. As the residential school era and Indian hospital experiences continued, 
many of our people opted to leave the reserve and eco to living in nearby urban centers. Initially, this was a very arduous and challenging change of lifestyle. In order to adapt, we would be required to adopt a new language, religion, and lifestyle, and address issues of racism and marginalization. Distancing ourselves from our traditional territories also meant challenges in accessing indigenous foods and maintaining our time-honored connection to our lands and waters. Waves of intergenerational impacts would sweep forward from these challenging times, and newly arising challenges would emerge through alcoholism, abuse and loss of culture, as well as losses to culturally rooted parenting skills, togetherness, and connectivity. Nonetheless, we chose this path as an effort to save what remained of who we are. Gradually, we began to observe social and civil changes that opened up more opportunities for our people to become equal members of this new way of life. The laws prohibiting us from practicing our culture were repealed. We were once again permitted to seek legal counsel to press for further protection of our rights and territories. We were granted the right to vote. And, slowly, the surrounding society became more accepting and tolerant of our differences. But, despite these accommodations, it became increasingly clear that we were unique and distinct. The culture and language of our people, though not as prevalent as former times, was still existent. The history, teachings, and stories of our people continued to be told and celebrated at our ceremonies. Those ancestral virtues that had guided us through countless challenges in our distant past had continued to steer us toward a future that included our culture. It was in these days that we identified ourselves as New Chonoth, the people where the mountains meet the sea. And it was in this time that we collectively began to explore where we want to be. My name is, uh, when I was born, I was given the name He Asmatli from, from my grandfather. I was born in, in, in Nutka. Nutka Canary, where my mother was working. And I, I don't remember the trip to home, which is Heskrit Haimais, where I'm from. So I was born in 1939. I was in a residential school, a Catholic residential school called Kaka, was a Christian Indian residential school. And uh, <clears throat> there was uh, one day we decided to get together because there was a brother by the name of Brother Samson. He was a cruel, extremely cruel man that was looking after the boys. And he was always picking on one or two of the boys that, that, that really no more fighting them. So one day we circled around him and said, if you touch that guy one more time, we're going to kill you. And uh, I guess that was my first the very first time that we dealt with some straightening somebody out that that was mean for no reason and we found out after we stood up to him that he was like anybody else so uh, once we confronted him his attitude really changed that was good for us we had a meeting in in tofino and at that time, the uh, Department of Indian Affairs used to call the meetings, and they call the tribes together. And we were meeting in Tofino, and this one day, a guy who became a great friend of mine, and he, he was really hostile. He said, why do we have to listen to the Department of Indian Affairs talking about our own problems? He said, let's chase him out of here and talk about our own problems, how we can correct them. And that's when things became very, it started the movement of uh, the politics moving for the tribes. Uh, when that, his name was Teddy Watts. He, I never forget because things, after that time we started to get together more and more and, and started talking about the injustices that were being created 
they, this is uh, the ironic part. Uh, under the government is is an uh, organization called Department of Indian Affairs, who is to be there looking after our interests. But it was always them that, that we basically were fighting for, against all the time. Here was the government, uh, which still exists to this day, that uh, we used to end up fighting with people that were supposed to look after our interests. So I think that uh, uh, many of the leadership uh, were b born from that time and said, hey, look, then we started to realize all the injustices that were happening amongst the First Nations. And we eventually organized ourselves. And uh, the first act that we done was we demonstrated in Nanaimo where Indian Affairs was when we occupied it. We knocked down the doors. We took out all the documentation that they had. We went through all the documentation uh, that was in the hands of Indian Affairs in Nanaimo. So we broke down the doors. And in, in Port Alberni here at, at Indian Affairs, we broke the door down there and took out the desks. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time we set up the organization on uh, Argyle Street. We were just, uh, just across the street from where we broke into. And, uh, Indian Affairs knew that we they, because they recognized their their desks that were, were set up. So, in the in my opinion, that was the only way that we could make things change was to show some radicalization from our part. And I think they realized that we were serious, and things started to change slowly. The guy who was going to university became an engineer, and he probably could have got the best job in the world under what he got educated under an engineer. His name was George Watts from the Shad Reserve. Mm -hmm. He decided he was going to be part of whatever we were doing, and it. At that time, it was a great move for him uh, because uh, with his educated mind and, and, and how we were to deal with government. So it took a, a, a bit of time. The first thing that we done, I never forget this meeting, we sat down and we said, why? Do our kids have to go to a residential school? There was one in Tinwis today, which is was called Tinwis, and the other one was here. So those of us that were there at the meeting said, "Well, let's shut them down." And we send uh, two people to the reserves, which had kids here from up north. They went there to visit the parents. Look, what this is what we're going to do. We're going to shut the school down. So George Watts and I went to see the uh, uh, Indian Affairs. His name, I think his name was Larry White. And we went there to see him in Vancouver. And he said to George, uh, what do you want? He said, I want to close the school down in Alberni. He said, when? Today. And the guy said, you got it. And we had a lot of support from elders, especially the elders that that existed at that time. And uh, there was uh, support right across from young people, the women. Uh, we had one woman out of Yiklulet. Gee, she was in one of the strongest New China people that was a great orator. Her name was Louise Roberts. And uh, she played a very important role in, in helping us getting the movement going because she was such a strong uh, orator. She, she, I 
to this day I, I can still hear her speak because she was such a strong speaker. talking about the health, health field, there was many examples used and in, in, in my time I used, I don't know if people remember when the Asiatic flu hit the New Charlotte area, but I was 17 years old living in Iadiset in a place called Queen's School. Oh, that community except for two people. The whole community went down with the Asiatic flu, and I got it. And uh, I was in bed for 30 days, and it, it, the disease was, uh, you'd literally break out in a sweat. And my, as sick as my mother was, she'd get up, change the seat, sheets, and then you would turn ice cold. <clears throat> That uh, whole month, the whole community. So we had two people, I never forget, Moses Amos and Charles John. Those two guys kept cutting wood every day to make sure that the houses had heat. Two out of the whole community. So we survived from those two men, but it was a, and that's when we said, there was nobody there. Uh, we could go to the hospital in Esperanza, but no, there was no doctor came, no nurse, nothing. We said, we got to change the system. We, we got to make sure that... Uh, so at first we were getting uh, uh, nurses that started to come into our communities, but we said, look, we've got to do better than that. We got to make sure that some of our young uh, people get back in or get into the nursing field, uh, which was a difficult thing for people because uh, we were not used to going away from home for long periods of time, which, which the nursing program takes several years to complete uh, away from home. So that was qu quite a process. So in places that we end up coming up with community health workers. By the mid-1900s, efforts were well underway to establish a political body that would oversee our nations that represented the west coast of Vancouver Island. In 1958, our nations formed the West Coast Allied Tribes and on August 14, 1973, incorporated as a non-profit society called the West Coast District Society of Indian Chiefs. Six years later, the name was changed to the Nuchonal Tribal Council. With a reclaimed identity as Nuchonal peoples, the next necessary steps were to reclaim authority over our governance, services, and finances. The Nuchonal Tribal Council was established and helped to blaze a trail for many other First Nations across Canada to reclaim authority over their health and well-being and nourish the cultural revitalization that was occurring among our people. As the Nuchonal Tribal Council continued to develop, further efforts were undertaken to establish health services that would partner with Nuchonal Thought to deliver professional, ethical, culturally sensitive, and responsible care. For several generations, the health and wellness of our people was entrusted in the services offered by the federal government. As our cultural identity regained strength, it became clear that the health services offered to our people required more emphasis upon culture and spirituality. Uh, my name is Wamish. Uh, my English name is Ken Watts. I'm Vice President of the Channel Tribal Council, and I come from the Sichuan First Nation as well as the Chachal First Nation in uh, Fountain, BC, just across the river from uh, Lillooet. That's where my, my mother's from. Uh, my father's late George Watts, and my mother's Mitchell Dalio. And I think about our child and family services, or child welfare, some people say, and our health and 
when that tribal council was first created, you know, again, it was to do things not just in a new channel way, but to, to have that kind of ownership that it's our program and we're going to deliver it how we want and we're going to do it, you know, as best of a new channel way as we can. We're recognizing that it's about a balance between the modern uh, medicine or what have you and, and a new channel way of doing things. So, you know, kind of marrying those two and it's up to us to do it. I think that's, that's what uh, my dad or old timers would have said then and still say now is that when we deliver child and family services or health or whatever have you, it's we're going to do it and we're going to do it our way. And I, I think we've been really successful as you know, recognized I think across the country as being one of the first, one of the first groups of nations to deliver health services or child and family services or even post-secondary program. Uh, we were one of the first across Canada because we said, again, not do we just want to take ownership, but we want to do it our way and we want to um, support our our youth or our children or our elders, whoever it may be, in a, in a healthy way. And, uh, you know, recognizing that because of residential school and other things that our people have struggled with, that it's, it's not going to be easy. It's never been an easy program or service to deliver. But I think we've done our best to, as my dad would say, to help, um, help like, create a better life for our people. And thinking about where they were when the Tribal Council was created to now, we've come a long way. And I think our people are doing really well, but they could always do better. Like, you know, we think about the different issues like diabetes, and we've got great staff now that are supporting our, our people in terms of health promotion and living a healthier lifestyle. But uh, we can always do better. I think that's that's what I was, I think my dad would always tell me and he'd always remind me is that you know, we should never settle for where we're at right now, that we should always be trying to aim for like that next step up and, and, and do an even better job than we're doing now so that, you know, we don't have diabetes at all. So none of our people are suffering from diabetes so that um, we don't face any more suicides in our communities or you know that huge goal of one day uh, none of our kids are in care that they, um, you know, that's, it's always about like setting that bar really high. So uh, I think we've done an amazing job in terms of program and services and health delivery and, um, since the Tribal Council was created until now. And I think I just love being a part of it. In preparation for this endeavor, Nuchano thought from many of our nations entered into nursing programs and other areas of health education. As our capacity grew to oversee our own health services, the NTC Health Board was established to help guide the process. Today, the number of health professionals and the revitalization of traditional medicinal knowledge that complement these services continue to expand throughout our territories. Good morning, Deb Foxcroft, President of New Toronto Tribal Council. I started out uh, with the New Toronto Tribal Council in the early 80s. Um, before that, I worked for my own nation. In, in, as, in my role as social development coordinator, I uh, was involved in the New Chonleth Health Study. And uh, in that health study that happened in the early 80s, to survey you know, the needs of our communities in terms of health. What came out of that study, though, was many other issues in terms of social issues. Um, one of the other areas was child and family services not only health, it's, you know, when we look at health, it's mental health, it's um, social development, it's, uh, it's nursing, it's doctors, um, but it encompasses um, a lot of the services. We would meet with all of the elected chiefs and councils around the table, and it could be up to 100 people sitting in a meeting. Um, so that report, uh, in terms of health, was brought to a tribal council meeting and uh, it was reviewed and approved by all of the chiefs and council at the time. Um, and uh, again, as I said, Child and Family Services came out of that report that people wanted to develop Child and Family Services, um, even, if, even when we were looking at the health. But it's, it really encompasses the health of our New Chonleth people. Um, and the, that, uh, from that report, of course, you know, the chiefs talked about a holistic approach that, you know, when we're looking at uh, health services, we have to look at uh, every part of our ourselves. And, you know, I, I remember the late George Watts, as our chairman of the Tribal Council, talked about, you know, we need to have good health services, but we also have to ha improve our water systems. We need housing. You know, we need economic development. We need we need self-determination to improve the health of our people. As working at, a, at the Tribal Council level, I see many changes um, in terms of our health. Uh, you know, we have a history of, of taking on uh, a lot of the social services and not just social services, we took on membership, education, 
health, child welfare, um, all of the, I think we have capital, we also have a capital department and fisheries and uh, so uh, it, the Tribal Council has quite a history of, of taking on those services and improving the services of the lives of our, our people and I, you know, I'm really been proud to be part of that and and now in a political position I I I uh, see uh, I know some of the history I don't know all of the history but I I just believe that uh, you know we're working in a good way to improve the lives of our our people most important part is I know that the programs and services and especially in health and other services are doing their best to incorporate our traditional culture language and teachings into um, those programs. Although we do have, you know, different um, agreements and relationships with, uh, with the government in terms of the service delivery, we still have an opportunity to make it uh, what we want for our own people. There has been much progress in regards to the development of our own health services. The enormity of challenges that our nations have faced in our recent history gradually dissipate with each new nurse, doctor and health professional that emerges from our communities. As times long past, we have reclaimed our ability to oversee the health and well-being of our own people and we can look upon the future of our health services with hope and optimism. We appreciate that this healing journey is ongoing and will require the effort of our non new channel partners as well that now travel alongside us in our healing and growth. Our traditional insights and practices relating to medicine and healing are essential to the health and wellness of all. The stories and teachings of our people, our history, and the challenges that we have overcome are important aspects of who we are and who we would like to become. As we journey toward a stronger and healthier future, we strive to bridge cultural gaps, revitalize fundamental healing practices, and meet emerging health risks head on with a collaborative and comprehensive approach. I think that getting back to listening to the elders, uh, I think me and a whole bunch of people, we could stand up and say, we achieved. Today there is some schools and some reserves. We had a really high graduating class. Uh, we've had now kids that have gone through university. Uh, and, and we now have uh, almost all of the First Nations are looking after the themselves. They've got administrators and the whole office people have had to get some training. They're looking after their own affairs, uh, which we always talked about, that we need to look after ourselves, to be accountable to ourselves, which was a big thing, uh, because uh, people at Indian Affairs said we're not accountable to us. So accountability became a really big issue. Somebody's got to be accountable to the people of where we come from. Thank you, George. I just have three more speakers, and then I think it's uh, be time to start uh, getting set up for this afternoon, uh, the signing and the, and the feast. Roy Hayupas, Mike Seven. She knows. She knows all 
all the ways of the monarchy, how they have interfered, the things that they have changed in our society, in our systems, trying to change our beliefs even, eh? Life is a treasure. Life is a real treasure. And Stanley is our key doctor in that, eh? No channel's native healer. He is dealt with. When the self takes time to listen to what's going on inside of me. Oh, oh, you not know, John, and this is what's missing from our healing systems, eh? Health services, not such a knowledge. They can't, they can't find it in some sort of knowledge. Oh, health, they have never lived our lifestyle, eh? And once we start including that, then I know we're on the road to hastier recovery. I know. Oh, science not summit. No, it's just, I saw my grandparents, eh? All those old people. Ha, dude, I'm a young man compared to those people who passed away late in life. 100 years, 110, 120 years old. Ha, dude. Lived right to an ripe old age. Some of them just went to sleep. They were gone into the next world, eh? States of living with those healing customs, tradition. <coughs> and I always say above all things that the new channel tribal government was one of the most democratic ones in this world. And that's a powerful statement. I know it is. Understanding our culture and who we are through self-identification and definition are important steps to lead us in this direction. We believe that it is equally important to explore the richness and depth of our ancestral values and practices as it is to truthfully recount the more challenging issues arising from cultural miscommunication. As we establish firmer common ground across cultures, we become more prepared to address larger health issues and concerns. Thank you for having the courage to join us in this journey and to listen to our story.